very much, uh, Madam President, for that kind introduction. And uh, I thought this topic is quite timely because in our day-to-day -day practice, many women over the age of 40 years and 50, 45 years with lots of medical complications, comes and asks loads of questions about contraception, even with our sound medical knowledge, sometimes we even get stuck answering and helping them selecting the most appropriate contraceptive method for them. So contraception in perimenopause and evidenced and practice-based approach for a prescribing dilemma. These are the key content, sorry about this. Right, sorry about that disturbance and these are the key content that we're going to discuss in this lecture. You all know fertility declines after the age of 30 years. However, effective contraception is required until menopause. It prevents unintended pregnancies. So it plays a huge part in minimizing unintended fetal maternal morbidity. Diagnosis of menopause, perimenopause, definitions, Contraceptive methods are available to perimenopausal women and no, importantly, no contraceptive method is contraindicated on the basis of age alone. Use of hormone replacement therapy with contraception alongside and added benefits of contraception in managing common perimenopausal problems. COCP in perimenopausal age group especially, when to prescribe and when not to, medical comorbidities and contraception, and importantly, when to stop contraception. My slides are going to be a little busy with lots of wording in it. I'm going to beg your pardon for it. Right, so as clinicians, we must carefully consider comorbidities when, pres when prescribing in this age group. Issues arising at this period, such as menstrual cycle abnormalities, beta's motor instability, the risk of osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease prevention, as well as the increased risk of gynecological malignancies should be taken into account before the initiation of a specific method. Lots of research and development into intrauterine contraception and other methods are on the way. However, they are not in clinical practice yet. Contraceptive methods with a recognized post-fertilization or pre-implantation effect may not be acceptable for some women. Some women may consider it's a routine abortive act. So, so when should be, women should be given information about all suitable contraceptive methods to make an informed choice. That is the most important thing. So what's different in physiology? We all know, so that it'll be an accelerated rate of loss of follicles until they are finally depleted. Aging follicles lose their reproductive quality and as a sequence, FSH levels goes up. In contrast to this, LH levels generally hangs up there until it starts to decline almost one year before menopause. All the above lead to chronic annual and ovulation, which explains the low fecundity rates in this age group. Occasionally, ovulation takes place. Even with very high FSH levels, such as 420 occasional, presumption of ovarian function has been demonstrated. So we cannot guarantee, even with biochemical testing, a woman may not get pregnant. We can only give them the evidence and supporting in their decision. Definitions. So menopause, it's permanent cessation of menstruation. Generally, it's a retrospective diagnosis, clinically confirmed after 12 straight months of amenorrhea. Perimenopause is the period before menopause and up to one year after last menstrual period. Plethora of psychological endocrine as well as psychological changes ensue, as we discussed before, 
giving rise to varied symptomatology. Diagnosis can be difficult, and especially in women whom they've been on hormonal contraception before. No accurate biological marker or a predictor exists which truly defines when fertility ceases. Short and non cycles can give rise to abnormal uterine bleeding. In the onset of menopausal symptoms, such as hot flushes, vaginal dryness, and loss of libido, women may attach less significance for the contraception. They tend to perceive the chance of getting pregnant is less. Moreover, vaginal dryness, itching, dyspareunia, all these can contribute to sexual dysfunction. However, 20% of the pregnancies do occur over the age of 40 years, and majority are unplanned. In fact, highest percentage of unplanned pregnancies have been reported in over 35 years. So this mandates effective, safe, and appropriate method of contraception until the menopause. So what are the challenges as physicians we do face day in and day out? Contraceptive choices may become limited by increasing comorbidities. Widely used international criteria such as UK medical eligibility criteria, UKMEC, FSHRH guidelines, and the CDC recommendations all might help in providing a framework. However, concerns regarding prevailing medical conditions, side effects in relation to individual methods, VTE risk, and many other unforeseen factors can hold back the healthcare provider as well as the patient. For an example, COCs offer various health benefits in addition to their contraceptive effects, which can be utilized effectively in this age group. Then again, majority of middle-aged women believe they should not take COC because of the ever highlighting side effects. This is one of the questions our patients come and do ask us, doctor, what is suitable for me? Generally, they inquire about COCP, uh, POPs, mini pills, implants, COPA, UCDs, Myrena, injectable contraception, DMPA, and sterilization, and of course, emergency contraception. It's quite difficult to analyze all these methods individually. So I'm gonna take COCs as an example and discuss about it. This is a summary of all the methods. Combined hormonal contraception, they give a regular bleeding pattern, which might satisfy the men's psychological needs in this age group. And it definitely reduces menstrual bleeding and hot flushes maybe can be used for prevailing diseases in this age group, such as endometriosis causing life, uh, long dyspareunia uh, and other symptoms. However, the disadvantages are they have slightly increased risk of thrombosis, breast cancer and cervical cancer prevalence and all these described side effects. Same goes with POP pills. Generally, they are safe in most other medical conditions, unlike estrogen containing pills. Then again, problem with POPs are mostly irregular unscheduled bleeding. Again, daily dosing is required. Progesterone only injectables. The larks, they are very effective. However, they can mask menopause. They can stop bleeding medically nine months to one year period. The other problem with them is they induced appetite increment so causing weight gain as well as reduction of bone mineral density, which is a concerning side effect in this age group. All the other three are very effective. If you look at this end of the slide, they are very effective even with non-perfect use. They're very effective in providing contraception. So COCs, they're highly effective. They're 99% efficacious with perfect use. However, with typical use, it declines to around 91 to 92%. Combined estrogen containing pills, skin patches, injectables, or the vaginal rings can be used according to the UKMA criteria, depending on the women. 
Perimenopausal women taking COCs may experience additional benefits compared to women in their early 20s and 30s, be it abnormal trend bleeding, heavy menstrual bleeding, treating dysmenorrhea, as I said before, alleviating postmenopausal symptoms, or just regularizing their periods. These additional benefits may promote an improved quality of life in perimenopausal women. There are other major health benefits beyond the female reproductive tract, importantly. Very well known benefit is preventing epithelial ovarian cancer. It increases proportionately with the duration of use and is sustained for 20 to 30 years, even after discontinuation of the method. Even if the, duration, even if the drug is used for a mere period of one year, the risk reduction effect can be sustained for 20 years after discontinuation. So that's a very big advantage in this age group. As you can see, the greatest risk reduction has been shown, which is around 80% in people who have used it more than 10 years. The incidence of endometrial cancer, colorectal cancers, and other cancers are common, can be diagnosed more frequently in this age group. Importantly, COCs reduces this. The risk for a woman who has ever used OC, risk of endometrial cancer is reduced by 50 to 80% margin. The preventive effect of COCs on cancer can be considered especially important for middle-aged women. COCs also have bone protection effects. After the age of 40 years, bone mineral density, as we all know, it gradually declines. Women taking COCs for at least six years prior to the menopause can significantly increase postmenopausal BMD in the femur neck and lumbar spine. COCs taken especially after the age of 40 years can reduce postmenopausal hip fractures by 30%. PID is one of the most common diseases in this age group. It's responsible for serious complications such as infertility and chronic pelvic pain. The risk of PID is reduced by 50% among OC users. The reason may be thickening of the cervical mucus and decreasing menstrual flow. Both high dose and low dose OCs cause a marked reduction in both functional and corpus luteal cysts on the ovary, preventing them from going through unnecessary surgeries. Studies have demonstrated reduction in breast fibroadenomas and chronic breast cysts. OC use has been proved to decrease both incidence and progression of rheumatoid arthritis. Sadly, only a minority of women during perimenopause uses OCs. Only 11% of women aged between 44 years and only 4% above 45 uses COCP. The statistic is for, uh, for UK. So they are not without risks, not, not generally recommended in women over 50 years. The baseline risk of VTE, myocardial infarction, and stroke is higher than compared to young women. Additional MEC2 risk factors for arterial vascular or venous disease, such as having body mass, high body, high body mass index, BMI over 30, dyslipidemia or diabetes generally preclude their use. But the important thing is there are many women without any of these medical comorbidities and still do not use COCP when they can easily prevent unwanted pregnancies with this simple method. In normotensive and non-smoking perimenopausal women without other risk factors, there is no additional risk for myocardial infarction or stroke. That's the most important fact. Breast cancer data shows a small increase during OC use, which begins to decline shortly after stopping, which disappears 10 years after discontinuation. Some may argue this increment of breast cancer may not be very high. It gives rise to only 3.4 additional cases per 10,000 cases. So it can be considered as a rare occurrence. In addition, many studies suggest that long-term use of OCs increase the risk of cervical cancer for obvious reasons. Finally, there is only a small risk associated with VTE. Actually, half the risk is observed in accidental uses in pregnancy. 
reduction of the estrogen and progesterone concentrations in modern OCs, especially up to the level of 20, coming down from 50 microns, has led to corresponding reduction in the incidence of above health risks. The highest risk of PTE is observed with preparations containing third generation progesterones, especially desogesterol and gestidome. Combined pills with lowest hormonal doses should be always chosen in this age group. Those containing 20 micrograms of ethanol estradiol would be best. However, lower the estrogen dose, high the chance of getting unscheduled bleeding. So that's a fact we need to consider when we are prescribing. The next question the patient asks is, doctor, how can my medical problems restrict me, restrict me in selecting the method that I want? In providing an answer, quick reference would be going through the UKMA criteria, medical eligibility criteria. As we all know, category one is there is absolutely no restrictions. You can use the method with benefits. Make two, advantages are more. Make three, theoretical or proven risks usually overweighs the benefits. So this should only be prescribed with expert clinical judgment. Category four is not suitable, unacceptable health risks. I'm gonna summarize FSHRH guidelines in relation to perimenopause, which should be an easy prescribing guide. If you go through this carefully, when we have other comorbidities, women with BMI over 35, and women who smokes, be it less than 15 cigarettes a day, and be it more than 15 cigarettes a day, CHC lies in three and four. So we should always try when we, uh, for a different method when we cease these problems. But most of the other methods, starting from DMPA to POP to COPA UCDs are category one. They can safely be used in all of these women with medical problems. Adequate to control hypertension for CS CHCs, it's category three. When it's not controlled, it becomes category four. So always be careful when you are prescribing CHCs in your hypertensive patient. However, other than DMPA, all the other three methods can be prescribed without any restrictions. This goes on to show other medical and surgical comorbidities, this which, which will help us in selecting the appropriate method. Full graph can be downloaded from the FSHRH guidelines. I'm just giving a summary here. Diabetes, when they do not have vascular disease, whether they're dependent on insulin or not, CACs are category two. This is our common patient. But when they have neuropathies, retinopathies, nephropathies, CACs become category three. Copper IUCD is a good alternative in these instances. Right, the next important question is when to stop contraception. During the menopause, FSH levels can fluctuate considerably. Neither a single FSH measurement nor the presence or absence of menopausal symptoms reliably predict the loss of fertility. Women over age of 50 years who do not use hormonal methods, contraception can be stopped after one year of amenorrhea as fertility is unlikely to return. But if they're less than 50 years, recommendation is you should continue it for another two years. Women on hormonal contraception, sorry about this, it should be hormonal, yeah, it should be hormonal contraception, this slide. Women who are on hormonal contraception, they can affect bleeding patterns, making it difficult for the clinician to advise when really to stop contraception. 
Women over 50 years using oral POPs only methods, subdermal implants and intrauterine systems should be continued for one year after recording two FSH levels at six weeks intervals. Important thing here again is when they're on CHCs, that can alter the FSH levels. So contraception method should be stopped two weeks, at least two weeks prior to testing. If they were on DMPA, as we know, they can stop bleeding nearly for nine months to one year. So test should be delayed up to one year. So this is again a summary in a graph, what we discussed. If you're on non-hormonal, can stop if you're over 50 years after one year, 40 to 50 years should continue for two years. COCs can be continued in age 40 to 50, beyond 50 years should be stopped and switched to a non-hormonal method or an progesterone containing method. LNGRUS is a good alternative in this instance. However, it's going to be an expensive alternative which costs nearly about 20,000 rupees if you don't have it in the garment sector. Then the DMPA can be continued in 40 to 50 years. Beyond 50 years, it's not generally recommended for the obvious reasons we discussed before, uh, including the effects on BMD. Progesterone only implant, mini pill and LNGRUS can be continued up to the age of 50 and beyond. They can be stopped at the age of 55 years, when natural loss of fertility can be assumed for most women. If a woman over 50 years with amenorrhea wishes to stop before the age of 55, the option would be to check the FSH levels. If it's more than 30, six weeks apart, it can be discontinued after continuing for another one more year. But if they are still in the premenopausal range, the option would be to continue and check their hormone levels in one, again after one year. Right. This is again a frequent question that we come across. Dr. Amon HRT, will it provide contraceptive effect? Will it provide me contraception? Absolutely not. Be it sequential combined or continuous combined, it does only prevent ovulation in only in 40% of women. So it's not an alternative for contraception. Contraception must be used alongside HRT to avoid unplanned pregnancies. Right, this is again a summary. LNG IUS, it's safe to use as contraception alongside estrogen of choice of HRT. If the woman is on estrogen HRT already, you can easily provide LNG IUS, which protects the endometrium from endometrial hyperplasia, as well as provide very effective contraception. DMP can be safe, however, it's not recommended for this very specific purpose. IMPS, again, scientifically can be thought of providing the same, but again, not really recommended in using routine clinical practice. In this slide, combined hormonal contraception do not use in combination with the HRT. It can be used in eligible women less than 50 years as an alternative to HRT. So one single tablet per day provides both options, HRT as well as contraception. If they're over 50 years, this option becomes unviable and should consider other methods. So in summary, contraceptive choice is determined by several factors, not only medical factors, but also social factors has to be taken into account. Locks, are an effective, acceptable, and safe choice for many women. For women over, aged over 50 years who are using non-hormonal methods, contraception is recommended until after 12 months of amenorrhea. If you are less than 50 years, for 24 months. FSH levels can guide your decision-making. So in conclusion, perimenopause is a time of change. It puts a lot of stress on women, be it socially, career-wise, and sexual dysfunction and other comorbidities as well. Fact, a healthy woman 
a healthy woman can use any hormonal contraceptive up to the age of 50, which is good for managing common gynecological problems. Unintended pregnancies is a disaster in this age group, personally and medically. Myths, my fertility is low. Well, it may not be. They have very good chance of getting pregnant if they don't use contraception. Please check my, they do come and tell us, please do check my hormone levels, but not always. Only in contraceptive induced amenorrhea. Is my contraceptive, my, is my HRT contraceptive? No, absolutely not. Sex stops at age 45. Hmm. The evidence is on to the other side. STIs goes up, abortions goes up in this age group. How long do women need contraception for? As a general recommendation, menopausal less than 50 years, two years from the diagnosis, menopausal more than 50 years, one year from the diagnosis. It provides good opportunity for health screening, starting from cervical screening to breast to gynecological cancers, and to talk about incontinence and other common problems such as gender prolapse. So what is the CV risk in COC, COC users? MI risk is one, one in three non-users. It goes up to 1.6. Well, it's not a huge increment. Ischemic stroke risk doubles. However, then again, absolute numbers are low. Same goes with breast cancers. It provides only 3.4 additional cases in 1,000. So these are one of the recent studies in 2017, studying 46,000 women by the RCGP. And it clearly highlights the importance of gynecological cancer and other cancer reduction use of COCs. Progesterone only contraceptives is an alternative when women have lots of medical problems. Same goes with injectables. They can be safely prescribed when you get used to UKMA criteria. So in conclusion, menopause is time of opportunity, risk, confusion, and optimism. So we should talk about it more. Thank you very much.